Hello, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another episode of Ask Dave. Today's question comes from Ben Breedlove, KI5JJD. says, I appreciate your helping me to study and get my tech license. I'm on the air now and have mounted an antenna on the side of my house with an eave mount bracket. Okay, outdoor antenna, first thing I think of is lightning arrestor and grounding. It says, but I do not have a ground wire to a three foot ground rod in the ground. Replace that three, please, with eight. It should be eight feet long, minimum. Can you tell me what gauge of wire do I need to get and do I attach it to the antenna or the pole holding the antenna? Thanks again, 73, Ben Breedlove. Okay, let's draw a picture of what he's got here. Here's the side of his house. And he is in a room out here. This is the roof up here. Okay, and this is ground over here. And he's got his station here. This is a tech station. And he's got a tech antenna. Now, to tell you what an eave mount is... This is the eave of the house, okay? It mounts generally here and comes out like that and provides a place to mount an antenna. This will probably all be metal, okay? So the counterpoise, which often sticks out kind of like this, is attached to the pole that's attached to this thing right here. And this is electrically separate, so that this is the driven part. Now, he says he has a ground rod right here. Let's assume it's eight feet. What should he connect the wire to? Okay, two things, really. And I'm going to go with what would be good and what would be better. This pole right here, which is right here, can come down to the eight-foot ground rod with a crimp connection on here. And technically, this should be number eight or thicker. Now, of course, the way they do American wiring gauge, a number eight is thicker than a number 10 is thicker than a number 12. You can get it insulated or not insulated. I would recommend probably insulated for the stretch right here. Just plain old THH. And you can get this easily from Home Depot or you can go bare. Okay. So that is the recommended. Now, does it terribly matter? You're not trying for direct lightning strike protection, although you should be. So I would recommend that your coax, the beautiful blue coax here, which is gonna come from this point right here, down here, down, and that should come all the way down to the ground rod where there is and I'll just put the word A, a lightning arrestor. Now there's polyphaser, alpha delta, and there's Morgan. I would not buy any other kind. This is the alpha delta model TTG 3G50, alpha delta communications. Know that there's nothing on here that says that it's UL listed. UL listed would be a good idea. And I'm looking into these. The Morgan is not listed, although it has been listed in the past. The design has not changed, but they've stopped the listing because the certification every year is expensive. But polyphaser, I'm still checking on the listing on that, okay? I'm going to make a major change to saying go with listed. So you've got the eight-foot ground rod. The cable connects there, the cable connects there, and then that goes into the house up to your radio. Now, normally we don't bother very much with the tech radios being grounded directly to ground, but you certainly can. Now, this is coax. Now, let's take this red wire, the same red wire that we have there. If you've got a power supply, which you probably do, because none of the VHF equipment is built in power supplies. You're gonna have a red and a black wire coming out here, okay? From the black wire, connect that to the wire out here. Again, this is a bare wire. It's a separate wire from this wire. The blue are coax, the red are grounding wires. Attach that down here to this also, and then that way your internal station will be grounded also. None of the VHF base station radios 
you know, inside radios, they're also usually mobile radios, has a separate grounding nut or anything on the back of it. Doing it through that will be sufficient to get you by. Now, in the event of a direct lightning strike, all bets are off, okay? But this is for the nearby stuff and so on that might otherwise fry the front end. Now, I have a little ICOM radio that I did fry the front end because I didn't have a connection to ground. There was no place for the electrostatic buildup to go. As the wind blows across your antenna, it builds up a negative charge up here, and then it needs to have a way to get to ground. And you do that through the antenna, uh, grounding this feature here. It will short across up there, and you'll be fine. That's how I would set up your station. You now, it used to be that I had all Alpha Delta lightning arresters, and now I've got all Morgan lightning arresters. Depending on what I find out, I want to make sure that my lightning arresters are listed. Listed means with UL, which means that if you have a lightning strike and it starts to fire, your homeowner's insurance will say, okay, you used all listed devices and you followed best practices, so fine. Uh, there have been instances where there have been fires caused by amateurish wiring, where the insurance company was less than helpful. So, there you go. By the way, you can get from the ARRL equipment insurance for your equipment, which will not be very expensive for what you've got there, that does cover lightning for the equipment, not ancillary damage from the lightning, but lightning for the equipment. I have suffered a direct strike. I was asleep at the time. I woke up about six feet in the air. It was extremely loud. I uh, had my rig completely disconnected at the time. However, it blew out IC inside the power supply, which was replaced for about a dollar. It completely, literally evaporated the antenna. It blew out the coax about a half wave down. It also destroyed my little Hayes smart modem. I'm dating it there. And also blew out, of all things, the garage door opener. So we got all that fixed and the insurance company covered the garage door opener and the Hayes smart modem. What was interesting, I had paid a couple hundred dollars for that Hayes smart modem, and they sent me about 30 bucks for a new modem. Now, I made a fortune for this. I went down to wherever they were selling things in those days, got myself a new modem for the 30 bucks. They'd gone down that much in value by then. So my fancy Hayes smart modem actually got replaced with a better modem because it would go to 50K, whereas the Hayes smart modem was 1,200 baud. So, there you have it. I hope some of those ideas uh, gives you some things that you can do or work toward as a goal. And you'll find that, that you're going to want to minimize the number of that number eight because it is a little on the expensive side, but you can get it easily at any hardware store or electrical supply store. So if you have any qualms about doing any of this, hire an electrician. You may need to hire a master electrician rather than a journeyman who will know how all these little things work. Until we next meet, good luck to you and all that you do, and 73.